Now, before we go anywhere into this list, I want you to know that we are ranking this from the viewpoint of Starfleet, which is why you're going to see some interesting listings in this. And also you're going to be like, hey, Sean, but but you always said and then and then this and then what? I should also probably point out that here in Triculture Towers, we have writers who have wonderful, wonderful passions like myself. And we have presenters who have wonderful, wonderful passions also like myself. And sometimes those two passions are different, which is why you need to check out the original written article for this list, which was written by the wonderful Marcus Fry, and you will see that their ranking is slightly different. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferry for Trek Culture, and here is every ensign ranked from worst to best. We start this list with a very dishonourable mention. They're not even being ranked. That's how annoyed Starfleet would be at Ensign Ro Laren. Now you're probably going, Sean, you you love this person. You, you, you ask for them to come back in every single list. And yes, that would be accurate. But from Starfleet... Starfleet's point of view, Ensign Rowe got trained up in Special Advanced Tactical and then fecked off. She then went to join the Marquis. No, 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 no. Sorry, bottom of the list. Number 11, Beckett Mariner. Ensign Boimler was able to reach some success by loyally following orders under any circumstances, but he really started to achieve more thanks to Beckett Mariner's coaching, who told him that Starfleet regulations are good guidelines, but they're not always the best for a particular scenario. Having said that, Mariner is probably not the example that we should all be looking to when being an Ensign in Starfleet. Not only that, she had in fact been demoted back down to Ensign by the time we meet her in the beginning of Starfleet Lower Decks. In that first episode, we also see her secretly smuggling farming supplies to some Gallardonians during their second contact, and because of the bureaucratic delays of the Federation, they would have starved before they could get the supplies. Sure, but again, the rules are there for a reason. So Mariner, fun as she is, gas as she is, good friend as she is, is in fact a dreadful, dreadful officer. Number 10, Wesley Crusher. While Wesley has been the butt of so many jokes for so many years, his reputation has softened in recent times. He did of course appear in the finale of Star Trek Picard's second season, reprising the role, but this time as a traveller as opposed to an ensign. While an ensign on board the Enterprise D, although he was shown learning at an exponential rate, he was in fact also responsible for some fairly major calamities. For example, the entire plotline of Justice was about him falling through the wrong flower bed, which results in Picard having to break the Prime Directive to save his life. Wesley has of course warmed to audiences as time's gone by and did make a cameo appearance in Star Trek Nemesis, where at that stage he'd become a Lieutenant Junior Grade. Canon status of Star Trek Nemesis is a little bit confusing because are we to believe that Wesley went off with the Traveller, took a year out to go back to the Starfleet Corps of Engineers, and then went back to being a Traveller again? It's all a bit confusing, which is one of the things that points Wesley so low on this list. Number 9. Pavel Chekhov Chekhov, of course, went on to achieve a number of great things in the films, but we're just going to focus on his time as an ensign during the original series, to be fair to the others here. After graduating from the Academy at the age of 22, Pavel Chekhov's first assignment was aboard the flagship of the Federation, the USS Enterprise. He started on a standard junior officer rotation before eventually earning the navigator position. Chekhov was a loyal officer and always eager to impress his captain, but that didn't stop him from doing what's right. When Kirk was possessed by Dr. Janice Lester in the episode Turnabout Intruder, Chekhov refused to follow direct orders in order to protect the lives of crewmates, who the Kirk imposter was trying to sentence to the death penalty. He didn't accomplish much else as an ensign, but was a talented bridge officer and joined a large number of away teams. But Pavel Chekhov had a slight temper that held him back at times. In The Trouble with Tribbles, he practically encouraged Scotty to start the bar fight with the Klingons after getting offended by their insults to Captain Kirk and the Enterprise. Number 8. Travis Mayweather the main reason why Travis Mayweather was such a good helmsman for the NX-01 was because he grew up on board a cargo freighter called the ECS Horizon. During his early life, he visited far more planets than the average 22nd century human and learned to fly just about any type of ship. Throughout Star Trek Enterprise, Mayweather piloted the ship through a number of highly dangerous areas, specifically when Enterprise had to traverse the Romulan Milefield in the episode Minefield, and he had to avoid making contact with the explosives, all while avoiding an attacking Romulan vessel and moving extremely gently to make sure that Reed, who was trapped on the ship's outer hull at the time, didn't fly off into space or take a direct hit from a mine. He was also instrumental in navigating the ship through the Delphic Expanse. His early experience piloting ships gave Mayweather a significant advantage over other experts in the field, especially since living most of your life in space was very uncommon at that time. Number 7. Samantha Rutherford there's no question that Ensign Rutherford enjoys working in engineering. In fact, at times, it seems like he likes the ship's warp core and Jeffrey's tubes a 
bit more than is healthy. Rutherford's Vulcan cybernetic implant has caused him some trouble in the past by suppressing his emotions, among other things, but it's also helped a great deal too by allowing him to sort through his memories, enhance his vision, and even change his personality. He's also one of the few Starfleet officers we've seen enhance their bodies with cybernetics, which not only helps him to work, but also shows his love of technology. Having said all that, it has of course been recently revealed that there's some sort of shadowy purpose behind this implant, one that's blocking some of his memories. We don't know yet exactly what went on in that room, but we do know that we love a good mystery. Actually, guys, we did find out who's responsible for Rutherford's implants and memory removal, but no spoilers here. Be sure to check out the ups and downs for the season three finale when you found out. The chief engineer of the Cerritos, Billups, regarded Rutherford as one of his best officers, but beyond that he also impressed Shax with his cybernetically enhanced combat abilities. Sure, Rutherford's made some mistakes in the past, like creating the homicidal hologram Badgie, but he's got the potential to become a really impressive officer in the future. Number 6. Devan Attendi Few ensigns embody the unapologetic optimism of Starfleet as much as Devan Attendi. Even when put in an uncomfortable situation, like being forced to manually pump a crewman's heart with her own hands, she always did it with a smile. In her past, Tendi was an Orion pirate, known as the Mistress of the Winter Constellations, but she soon decided to leave her homeworld to join Starfleet as she didn't feel like she fit in with her fellow Orions. This comes up again in the episode where they visit Deep Space Nine and she meets Mesk, a fellow Orion who's been faking at being a pirate. She actually gets rather upset when people would compare her to other Orions who were known as pirates and smugglers throughout the Alpha Quadrant. This gives her a strong desire to prove herself. Upon arriving at the Academy, she became so engrossed in her studies that she didn't even get a chance to explore places on Earth outside of San Francisco. She graduated as a member of the Sciences Division and eventually became one of the top junior medics on the Cerritos and also worked plenty of side projects like her genetically modified The Dog. Number 5. Hoshi Sato Hoshi Sato was one of the most talented linguists on Earth when she took a commission aboard NX-01. She'd made a few mistakes and eventually ended up being discharged for breaking her commander's arm, but Starfleet allowed her to return because they desperately needed a new language expert. She didn't want to leave her teaching job at first, but decided it would give her a great opportunity to learn new alien languages in space. She was the first human to become fluent in Klingonese and spoke and understood over 38 languages by 2152. Using her talents as a linguist, Hoshi also helped gather important information on the Zindi from the Osarians in the episode Anomaly, greatly helping with that conflict. Later in her life, she even developed the Lingua Code Universal Linguistics Matrix, a system that could aid in communication during first contact when universal translators failed. She retired from Starfleet with the rank of Lieutenant Commander after the Federation Charter was signed, but accomplished more as an ensign than some did as admirals. Number 4. Bradbert Boimler now, Brad Boimler gets mocked a lot for being so awkward and naive, but he's got talents. He's clearly got a passion for his work, trying desperately to impress his senior officers to move through the ranks. He always did his assignments to the best of his ability. He went and tried so hard to follow every protocol to the letter and was the only crew member aboard the ship who wasn't bothered when Captain Freeman banned buffer time. After Boimler helped defend the Cerritos against Pac-Led invaders in the episode No Small Parts, Freeman actually called him one of her best officers, leading to Captain Riker offering him a promotion to Lieutenant Junior Grade and a position aboard the USS Titan. Soon later, a transporter accident split him into two exact copies, and one of the Boimlers got to stay as a lieutenant on the Titan, but the original had to return to the Cerritos as an ensign. Starfleet believed that it was an unnecessary complication to Titan's mission to have two of the same person in the crew, though that's really no reason they needed to demote him. Number 3. Sylvia Tilly Tilly showed early signs of her science skills when she reprogrammed her food synthesizer to only produce ice cream at the age of nine. She eventually attended Starfleet Academy and fast-tracked in order to serve aboard Discovery and work on the experimental and highly classified spore drive while still a cadet. So don't tell anyone I just told you that. Because of her involvement in escaping the Mirror Universe and ending the Klingon War, Tilly was promoted from cadet to ensign and shortly after she started the command training program to accomplish her goal of becoming a captain, beginning research on how to use dark matter as an alternative way to interfere interface with the mycelial network. Tilly's career progression was somewhat altered when she went forward with the rest of Discovery into the 32nd century. There, she learned how to improvise and adapt, so much so that when Captain Saru required a new first officer, he selected Tilly for the job, though she still retained the rank of ensign. Now that makes her one of the very few ensigns to ever serve as second in command of a starship. She eventually left Discovery to go on and become a trainer at Starfleet Academy, where she was tasked 
tasked with aiding and training the next batch of officers that would go through Starfleet. Tilly is perhaps one of the ensigns on this list that has seen the most varied amount of service in such a short amount of time. Now, while there are, of course, two more who will top this list over her, Tilly is easily one of the most impressive candidates to ever hold the rank of ensign in Starfleet. Number two, Harry Kim. Ah, Harry, our forever ensign. Typically, Starfleet officers who perform well only stay in ensign for around three years, but because of Voyager's unique circumstance being stuck alone in the Delta Quadrant, Harry Kim stayed at this rank for around seven years. Because of this, he had more experience as an ensign than anyone else on this list. Harry graduated from the Academy as valedictorian of class and was apparently trusted and talented enough to immediately be given a spot on the bridge as the chief operations officer, something very uncommon for new graduates. In this role, officers that would normally outrank an ensign actually served under him. Occasionally, he even commanded the night shift and led away missions. His other achievements include helping to design and build the Delta Flyer, helping to save the entire crew in the episode Workforce, and going back in time in the episode Timeless to save Voyager from crashing into a planet. There wasn't much room for promotion on Voyager, but Harry Kim still managed to go above and beyond his duties of a typical ensign. Without his help, Voyager probably would have never made it home. Number one, Nog. Nog defied the expectation of both his family and Starfleet by becoming the first Ferengi to join the Academy. Given that Ferenginar was not yet a member of the Federation, this in itself was a great accomplishment as he needed an endorsement from a command level Starfleet officer to even be considered, an endorsement that Sisko eventually granted. Even before he graduated from the Academy, Nog helped reveal a Starfleet conspiracy in the episode Paradise Lost and was captured by Jem Hadar in Rocks and Shoals. He went a long way from being taught how to read by Jake Sisko in the episode The Nagus to becoming an ensign in only two years, half the time it takes most cadets. After becoming an ensign, he fought in the Dominion War, helped to retake Deep Space Nine, and lost his leg in combat during the siege of AR-558. Because of his exceptional work protecting the Federation, Sisko put him through for a promotion to Lieutenant Junior Grade as one of his last official acts as commanding officer of the station. Nog became a war hero after being doubted by Starfleet and his fellow Ferengi alike, and for that alone he would deserve recognition. But when you add it all together, there is no question as to who on this list List is the greatest ensign in Starfleet. That's everything for our list. Now, as I said, make sure you read the written article of this by Marcus Fry. There is a very different order, one that is also as completely valid as this one. Remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself on Twitter and the various socials at Sean Ferrick as well. Until I see you again, make sure that you live long and prosper. Make sure you look after yourself. Our friends in Ukraine, stay safe. Our friends in Iran, your bravery is incredible. Please keep going. Everyone, have a wonderful time until I see you again. Make it so.